Good morning. I am very grateful that I am able to come and be with you all this morning. I was just admiring the beautiful stained glass, and I had said earlier when I was here for the early service that I think you all have the best music, but now I think I want to say you all have the most beautiful stained glass in Redlands. <laughs> so I'm, I feel very blessed to be here. Um, I, you all know I'm Cheryl Prince McMillan. I'm the director at Christian Counseling Service, but I'm also an ordained minister. And I was a pastor for many years before I worked as um, an administrator and therapist at the counseling clinic. So it's fun for me to be able to preach for some of our churches that support us. And I'm, I've been in a unique position that I got to preach at the Congregational Church and the Lutheran Church. And, and I get to preach at the Congregational Church in Highland and a couple of the Adventist churches in Loma Linda. So it's kind of fun to see the differences. But I drug my 19-year-old daughter around with me a couple years ago to all of the churches, and she came home very disappointed, and I, I was sad. I was hoping she'd find that maybe if our church wasn't her church home, another one would be a good church home. And no, she said, it didn't really matter. They were all the same. <laughs> so I thought that was actually a really good thing to see that we are all the same shining through that Christian tradition. And even though there's differences sometimes in how we do things, that the, the sense of Christ coming through in each of the churches we visited. And she thought it was also funny that we even sing the same hymns. So there you go, we're all the same. So I, I'm, I have three kids, and they keep me busy, but the clinic also keeps me very busy because we've been growing. I got to bounce in and out of the clinic both as a, a student, I went there, when I was an intern way back in 1986 as a student therapist and intern marriage and family therapist while I was pastoring full time. At that point, there was five people as part of the clinic and they resided in the back wing of First Baptist Church right across the street from you. So Christian Counseling Service had that whole back wing. Before that, we had resided in the little White House. I was never there. That was before my time behind the Presbyterian Church. Christian Counseling Service started with five area churches who wanted professional mental health to be available to not only their congregations, but to the community at large. And we are partnering with people um, like Youth Hope. I haven't met the chaplain who spoke to you this morning, so I'm gonna make a point of grabbing him afterwards because pastors and chaplains still are the first line for everybody's mental health um, concerns. And even though we have wonderful resources in the clinic, we want to make sure that we can get them in the doors, and sometimes that's the hard part. But I started with CCS way back then, kind of bounced in and out because I was working full-time elsewhere. And CCS was there with five people, and now we have 75 people, and I'm there full-time as the CEO. And we have some wonderful programs that I'm just going to take a minute to tell you about because you can benefit from them too. Um, Reverend Stu tells me that he's hoping that you all might join us and be a formal supporting congregation, but some of your church members I know have already come through our program in different ways. So in my, my opinion, you're already a supporting congregation. If I get to show up here and you show up there, ah, we already are, are working together. We have programs for little kids all the way from birth up to um, 18 years old. You think, what on earth do you do with a baby for mental health? It's actually a whole new field called infant mental health, and they do actually have certificates in infant mental health. The focus is on the child's development and their social-emotional development in terms of bonding and attachment and their cues, their being able to have eye contact. So we have little tiny ones coming in the clinic. We have a program for our teens and for kids who have had trauma. And we've had a number of these kids who've tried to attempt suicide come in and be part of our program. And so we're very glad that we're there as a resource. And this weekend, it would be remiss if I didn't tell you, we also have a military family center. We've been doing that for six years now, and we have a contract with the county for another five years. So I'm very pleased to know that we have county funding. We partner with Equus Mendendi, and we do equine therapy, which I think is very cool, out in the canyon. So some of our vets who don't want to sit inside a stuffy office can go hang out with horses and a mental health clinician. So we have a number of innovative programs, but one of the things we've been really focusing on is what we call trauma-informed care. And I'm sure if you're in the medical field, you've already heard that. 
But trauma-informed care means we tend especially to paying attention to traumas that people have gone through and know some innovative ways of working with trauma. So CCS is growing. This year, we anticipate about 5,000 families and individuals will be going through our clinic in some way. So I'm excited that, that you all are a part of our ministry in this community. And whether it's you who needs help, or a member of your family, or someone who comes in, I hope that you remember if you need any type of services, please come in and, and we offer free screenings for our, our participating churches and I would be happy to consider you as one of our participating churches as well. So this morning, besides talking about the, the good things that CCS is doing, I want to talk to you about the story that was read for us in scripture. So we'll, we'll shift gears from thinking about mental health in the clinic to talking about the woman that we read about in Mark 4. In Mark 4, if you have your Bibles and you want to look along with me, we will talk about the woman who is, her story is found in Mark, excuse me, Mark 5, Luke 8, and Matthew 9. So all three of the synoptic gospels talk about the hemorrhaging woman. Now, I had said earlier at church that, that this is not something that we're supposed to talk about. We don't talk about you know, menstrual cycles and hemorrhaging and menopause, those are not things we talk about in polite society, especially not in church, right from the pulpit. We don't talk about those things. And yet the story is in the Bible, so I guess we better talk about it because there it sits in the Bible for us. So I was, I was telling everybody this morning that when I first heard somebody preach on this hemorrhaging woman story, the woman who preached gave her a name and she named her Flo. And... <laughs> I wasn't sure if we should use that name or not, but it, it does help you remember she exists when you chuckle about the fact that she is there. It's, her story has actually been one that has been very meaningful to people in Christian groups through the centuries. Um, under the Roman catacombs, there are two large um, murals, I guess is not quite the right word, but it's into the stone of, of the woman touching the garment of Jesus. It's also on a couple of very old vases, and it is one of the very old stories in the Christian tradition of how Jesus healed people. Now, we know that he healed the blind and the sick, but this is a very tangible story in Mark about a woman who actually, we know a little bit more about her illness than most of the other people in scriptures. In fact, when you read the Bible and you read the New Testament, you read all these stories of Jesus healing, it usually says somebody was blind, they got healed, or his friends lowered him, and then he got healed. And there's not a whole lot of detail about their illness. And dear Flo here, we've got all the details. And so she was sick for 12 years, 12 long years. And I know I've had a, a couple of chronic illnesses, and I can tell you, and I'm sure many of you could tell me as well that being sick for 12 years is utterly exhausting. To know that it's day in and day out and you can't escape it. Anything that's chronic that hangs on to you, you just can't get rid of your body. You're stuck with it. And if it fails us, we're stuck with that too. And this woman wanted so badly to be back part of the society. Remember, in Jewish society, if you were a menstruating woman, you were not allowed to be in the synagogue. And in fact, you weren't allowed to be around the men, particularly rabbis and teachers, because your blood flow made you unclean. You weren't even allowed to sit on a chair that a man might sit on, because you would, by sitting on the chair, contaminate the chair, the man would be contaminated, and you now have made a man unclean so that he couldn't go to church. Can you imagine living like that for 12 years? In essence, you were a leper, but you couldn't even join the leper colony because you were unclean. You couldn't be with your children. You couldn't be with your spouse. You were either living at home alone or you were on the street. If you were to touch anyone, you would make them unclean. In fact, women during that time were unclean not only when they menstruated, but for seven days after they had gone and performed the ritual mikvah bathing before they could go into the synagogue. That meant for all women, two weeks out of every month, 
they were unclean. But this dear woman was unclean and hurting and miserable, and she had a continuous flow of blood, we are told. So you know that that is debilitating. She would have been low in iron. She would have been low in her vitamins. She would have just been sick for 12 years. But her story doesn't just sit there for us in the middle of Mark all by itself. It is packed on either sides by the stories of Jesus' activity of healing in the community. And Jesus was actively going around and touching the sick and the blind and healing them. And he had just performed a miracle and told someone that they had been healed and their sins forgiven. And everybody was aghast. How could he forgive sins? And Jesus went out in a little boat and it sailed along and I can just see him taking a breath. Those of us that are a, a little more on the introverted sides, but we have to show up and be extroverts, you know that feeling of when you finally can take a step back and go, oh, I love those people, but I'm glad I'm gone. That was where Jesus was. Bodies were actually a lot more acceptable to be talked about during that time because you, you really couldn't cover everything up. You know, you... We see in the scriptures the robes, but we see their legs sticking out. We weren't yet in a time of Puritanism or Victorianism. So people would know that this woman was unclean because as she would walk down the street, she would leave a trail. It was humiliating. And the idea of this man coming to her town was a hope against hope that something could change. She came up to the crowds, and we know that there are crowds around Jesus. The scriptures tell us that the crowds came around him, and if you look at Mark and you read with me in chapter 5, that we know in verse 21, when Jesus crossed again by the boat to the other side of the lake, the crowd gathered around him, and someone from the synagogue, one of the leaders, Jairus, came running up and said to him, Oh, Rabbi, please come to my daughter. She is 12 years old and she is at death's door. I will tell you, I've preached about the hemorrhaging woman many times before, and I don't know how I missed it. But out of all the times, it wasn't until this week when I was preparing for you all that I realized Jairus' daughter is 12 and the hemorrhaging woman has been sick the entire lifetime of this young girl. And I am absolutely sure that in the Synoptic Gospels, when they all three Gospels tell the story of 12 years, it's not just someone who is sick, but 12 is noted. You know in Hebrew thought, 12 meant perfect. 12 meant whole. And yet we've got a 12-year-old girl at death's door and a woman who'd been sick and 12, and it was 12 years of misery, not 12 years of wholeness. It was 12 years of chronically being sick. Jairus came, and I could imagine if I was the woman, I would immediately start losing hope because here's somebody important with a young girl who is at death's door, and what takes precedence? An older woman who is hemorrhaging and hemorrhaging and has been there forever and is just chronic, and everyone knows she's kind of the pain in the neck because she's hanging out there, or a young girl from the leader of the synagogue who's at death's door. So I can imagine her following along, seeing Jairus come, her hope sinks, but she still wants to be healed. She wants to change. She wants to be renewed and refreshed, and she doesn't want to be sick anymore. Jairus came and said, please come heal my daughter. And the woman about that time reached out and just touched the fringes, we're told. Literally, in Greek, it's the fringes of the rabbi she touched, his religious symbol, the one that was supposed to be holy, this contaminated, unclean woman touched. And the large crowds pressing around, at once Jesus realized power had gone out of him, and he turned and said, who touched me? In one of the Gospels, we have Peter going, oh, come on, there's crowds, Jesus. How could you even ask this? Here in Mark, we just, the disciples all say, oh, come on, how can you even think that you can identify one person? 
They're all crowding around you, verse 30 says. And don't you see in 31 that the people crowding you? How can you even ask us that? But Jesus looked around and he looked at the woman and he knew everything that had happened to her. And she fell at his feet and trembling with fear told him her whole story. And we actually have here the phrase in Greek is that she shared her whole soul, all of her. He knew all of it. I don't think that he stood there for hours listening to every little detail. I think there was just the sense of being heard. Have you ever really been hurting and went to talk to a friend or a counselor and just felt that it was such an unburdening to let your story out, to know that somebody heard you, knew you, it didn't fix things, but it certainly lightened them. And we're told in verse 33 that she told him her whole truth. We often in our clinic use what's called the ACE score. Many of you may be familiar with this. It's based on a longitudinal Kaiser study. They had over 17,000 participants. What they were looking for, ACE is adverse childhood events, they were looking for what created higher risk for health conditions in adulthood. And what they found that there was a direct correlation between adverse childhood events and negative health outcomes as you became an adult. So in other words, if you were in a family that had abuse growing up, you are more likely to have a heart attack, diabetes, or a mental health condition. You are not only more likely, but you are at 14 times the greater risk of suicides if you have four or more ACE scores. You are 11 times more likely to have drug abuse. You are four times more likely to develop depression. And 67% of our population has at least one ACE score. Most of the kids we see in our clinic have at least four ACE scores. And if you want to know what your ACE score is, you can Google ACE or adverse childhood events and you can look for the little survey, or you can just listen quickly and count on your fingers. An adverse childhood event, you can count one for each of these things that happened growing up. When you were a child, think back when you were a child, did anybody swear at you or act in any way that you might be hurt? If so, count one. Did a parent or another child in your household slap, push, or grab you? Count one if that happened. Or an adult five years older than you touch or handle you in any way inappropriately? If so, count one. Did you have anybody that loved you in your family? And if you didn't feel loved, count one. Did you not have clothes or food? If not, count one. Were your parents separated or divorced? If so, count one. Did you ever see domestic violence, someone hit in your home? If so, count one. And did you ever have somebody drinking in your home or doing drugs? Was someone in your home incarcerated or had a mental illness? Now, if you count all those items, each one is your A score. If you are below three, you are like 67% of the population. If you are like four or more, you are at extreme risk, and you need to be very intentional about reaching out, just like the woman we began out in Scripture, of reaching out for help. Four or more A scores puts you at risk of losing 20 years of your life, an early death, 20 years younger. One-eighth of the population has four or more ACEs, and in California, we know that those kids in foster care have high ACE scores, and in San Bernardino County, 12 out of 1,000 kids are in foster care. In our clinic, we have about 500 kids that come through annually in our Very Young Children 0-5 to five program, and about 80% are in foster care. Of those kids, we see some severe trauma. One of the little boys recently had been in eight foster homes, eight, and he was four years old. I can't even imagine bouncing around feeling that nobody wanted me, nobody loved me. Mom had been involved in substance abuse and dad was in jail. And they tried to get mom clean to take him back, but mom just kept falling back into those old patterns. It's so easy to fall back into the patterns that we've had from when we were young. And he bounced around, and the last family he was with said, we can't keep him either. They gave notice within 24 hours of receiving him that they wanted him to leave. 
he actually ended up sleeping on the floor of CFS with numbers of other kids that did as well. This child was fortunate to have a dad who wanted him. And the dad worked really hard, came into clinic, went through our parent and child interaction program, learned new skills, and continues to work hard to keep the child safe. That child, knowing that his parent is learning skills, is getting um, support from the community, is attending schools that know that he's had a hard background, that child is at 80% risk of going straight into jail as an adult. And only with some mitigation of these factors will he have a normal and healthy life. Adverse childhood events affect us emotionally, physically, and our general health. And we know that these kind of events can happen in adulthood too. You may have had a lovely storybook childhood, but if you are one of our veterans and you went out to war, those events, that PTSD symptoms can also affect you in a similar way. It's why we have our clinic particularly focusing on vets and their families. These ACE scores tell us you're at high risk. But the question is, what do you do if you're at high risk? You can't go directly to Jesus and touch his garment like this woman did. You can't tell Jesus your whole story other than here or in prayer you can share your story, but you can't see him and hang on to him. And if you know or you know somebody who has these ACE scores, you need to be able to find a place of healing. And healing comes through telling the story. You can find life, wholeness, and salvation is what the story in Mark 5 says by being able to be known and share your story with someone who listens. And Jesus said, I will make you whole. And the word is whole in terms of health, in terms of insight, in terms of salvation. It all meant the same thing. This woman is now saved. She is whole. She is healthy. She has been restored. But the word used here means she's also restored to the community. She's no longer unclean. So Jesus not only healed her of the bleeding, but he wiped out the fact that she was unclean. She didn't have to wait seven days to be part of the community she was now whole and healthy. But what do we do to overcome these adverse events that affect us? You know that research is done on what are the protective factors for people. If you've got all these negative factors, what protects you? And you know one of the number one factors? Is churches tend to have far less problems with mental health than people who don't attend churches. In fact, you reduce the likelihood of a major mental health event by 60% just by showing up. They've also found that prayer is effective in terms of centering and reducing stress. And guess what? Friendship is the number one thing that will give you support to overcome these adverse childhood events. And showing up here at church, you develop relationships. And if you can't name five to seven people you go to in an emergency, you need to be working on friendships. Friendships are what God calls us to as a community to hold each other to compassion and life. We are the hands and feet of Christ. We are called to compassion, generosity, and friendship. We are called to be reaching out to the community and to one another. We are called that through Christ, we can say your faith has healed you Go in peace and be free of your suffering. Wouldn't it be wonderful if I can say that to you right now? Go in peace and be free of your suffering. I encourage each of you to make sure you have somebody who can know your whole story, who can know your heart and your soul. And I am thankful that this church, along with other churches in the community, works with places like Youth Hope in order to offer hope and compassion to those outside of these walls. And I am grateful for those of us who are not missionary-minded that we have a good reason to drag people into church because we want them to be able to say, ah, oh, someone can hear my story and I can be in a place where there are people who reach out to touch the hem of Christ. There is a short poem that I like by David Wyatt. It says, enough, these few words are enough. 
if not these words, this breath, if not this breath, this sitting here, this opening to this life we have refused again and again until now, until now. And I encourage each of us that this be the now that you open your heart up to Christ, that you reach out for others who need the hand of compassion, that this be the now that you can touch the hem of his garment and find the cure. I pray this for each of us.